Good Arvo, uh, good friends, or even if I don't know you, good Arvo nonetheless, uh, new friend. My name is Daniel and I study game design at the Griffin Film School. I've had a lot of uh, people say, oh, game design, that sounds cool. But from my perspective, Jesus is more cool. Uh, you might disagree. I mean, he's very old, but I think he's cool. Uh, we, Griffith Christian students, are, a, are essentially a glorified book club that loves to discuss, share, and well, heavily recommend the best-selling book on earth, the Bible. I really like to talk about this Jesus character, you know. I, I, I said I think he's cool. Um, I know others tend to agree. Um, normally, we would gather together at the uh, Queensland Conservatorium and the Queensland College of Art. For now, however... Zoom, Facebook, and or your comfortable uh, bed will have to suffice. If you're regular here, cool. Uh, if you're new or just visiting, whether that be because you stumbled across us, or you were invited, or otherwise recommended, I'd like to give you a massive uh, welcome. Shortly, our very own uh, not-so-cool speaker, uh, Peter, will be giving us a talk. Um, in it, we'll propose the question, what does it look like to stay a Christian? We'll be continuing on with our series in Philippians, opening up chapter 2 to help answer this. We'll also have a couple of uh, Q&As throughout the talk where Peter will go through the chat, and for any questions, stay and consider whatever else you have to say, whether that be uh, humble comments or of couple of general discussions. Furthermore, we'll have an interview with our guest, uh, Chief uh, Amaran Dasha. I hope uh, they don't mind me calling uh, the name Chief, because with age comes wisdom, and hopefully, uh, we'll be able to learn a little bit more from what they have to say. Uh, now then, on the screen or in the chat, we should have a link uh, for a connect card. We'd really appreciate it if you'd uh, take the time to fill that out. Let us know uh, what you think, if it's uh, good, bad, or just cringy, let us know. The next announcement uh, particularly concerned our regulars, but we'll be holding an annual general meeting on Monday, uh, Monday the 31st of August. Yeah. Uh, in two weeks' time. I mean, I don't like him, but I like him the word meeting, non excitement, um, unless you're being part of the person being recommended, uh, like I have been. Um, if you wish to join, you have to explain some more details. Finally, uh, one question at my mouth, we should be having a theology hot spot. Last week, we compared Jesus to Silicon Valley um, concerning um, incarnation. I'm curious to see what uh, other interesting analogies uh, Peter and Chuck can uh, use the future about today's topic. Uh, Peter, Chuck? Hey everyone, um, can you unturn that off please? Um, sorry about that, we've had some issues with technology um, tonight, so I'm not quite sure if anyone could um, hear what was going on just then, but I just want to um, add my welcome to Dan's to say welcome to our main meeting for tonight. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm one of the staff workers at Griffith Christian Students in Southbank. Um, this is Peter. Hi. Yeah, hi. So um, just in case you missed some of the, um, the key announcements we had, is that tonight we're continuing our look through the book of Philippians and thinking about what does it take to stay um, a Christian for the long haul? Um, why would anyone bother to do this? And um, how can you possibly hang in there for your entire life? Um, if you've got any questions or comments or want to just say hi to us or make contact with us, there's a, um, there's a link in the, um, the Facebook page. We'll be putting that up in the comments section throughout the night a little bit later. So feel free just to jump on that website and just um, put in your details and say hello. Um, yeah, and as usual throughout the night, we're gonna have some Q and A and just random banter in the both the Facebook comment thread and also on the Zoom. So if you're in um, watching on Facebook, that's great. But there's also a group of us here on Zoom where we can kind of see each other and hang out a bit. Um, Tonight, um, we're going to have an interview with um, Keith Birchley, who's a, uh, a former AFES worker at the Con and at UQ, but now is doing something a bit different. So it's going to be great to chat to him um, a little bit later on. But right now, um, we're going to do a thing that we've launched in the last couple of weeks called the Theology Hotspot. I think that's what we're up to. Is that right? That's right. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dan, I hope you're resurrecting your voice somewhere. 
Uh, I could see some comments flying around on Zoom saying it sounds like underwear, sounds like he's underwater. Under underwear or underwater? Underwear. Yeah, no, I heard underwear as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could be wrong on that, but uh, it didn't sound very good, mate. But um, yeah, hopefully you can all hear us now. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yep. So we're in the section now that we're doing the theology hotspot. And this is a chance each week when we dive a bit deeper into hmm. Um, an area of Christian thought or theology. Um, it's sometimes will be a bit random and sometimes it comes from the passage. Um, yeah, so tonight we're, we're kind of going into a bit of a topic, but it's probably more of a how-to kind of, how-to kind of guide, like a methodology sort of thing. Tonight we're going to be chatting about the idea of concurrence. That's another big word. Last week we looked at incarnation. Tonight it's concurrence. And the idea of this is it's just two seemingly contradictory things that the Bible teaches. What do we do with that, Peter? Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, one example of concurrence would be uh, in the story of the Exodus. If you'd flip open to the second uh, book of the Bible and read the story uh, of Joseph and, uh, sorry, Moses and Pharaoh. It's good to get the name right. Moses and Pharaoh. Uh, so, in the story of the Exodus, you read two concurrent truths one truth uh is that sometimes pharaoh hardens his own heart but other times it also says that god hardens pharaoh's heart so we can read both of those things and go well they can't both be true it's got to be one or it's got to be the other when in reality both of those truths are concurrent they're two concurrent truths. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about concurrency. Uh, so there are a number of concurrent truths in the Bible. Uh, the big one that most people bring up, I can see already somebody talking about it in the uh, Zoom chat, like predestination and free will, or some people call that uh, divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, things like you're saved by faith, uh, but you're saved by works. Um there's other things in the Bible like humans killed Jesus, but then there's other parts that tell us well, that God very carefully planned Jesus' death. And we'll be coming across another one of these concurrent ideas in tonight's passage, so keep an eye out for that. But for now, we, what we're going to do is we're just going to hit the pause button and ask, how do I deal with these seeming contradictions when I come across them in the Bible? Uh, dealing with this stuff can be hard. So, I don't know, Catherine, how do you feel when you come across a seeming contradiction in the Bible? It can be, like, I guess, a real dilemma. Like, it's something that can be unnerving. And mm. um, that's speaking as someone who's been reading the Bible for a while, let alone someone who's kind of new to it. So, if you're new to reading the Bible and kind of just coming across different things that don't quite seem to line up with each other, there's a few different responses I've seen. Um, Quite often you might just say, oh, I can see X over here and Y over here. And that doesn't seem to make a lot of, um, doesn't make a lot of sense. So obviously the Bible doesn't make sense. I'm going to just ditch the Bible altogether. So that's one re response. That's quite an extreme response. Another one might be that um, you might go, well, these two things can't both be true. So therefore I'm just going to pick one of them and put my eggs in that basket. And we'll just so we'll just try and figure out how to read God's word in a way that kind of explains away the other option. Yes, I think that's two options that I've actually seen um, seen a bit, I guess, over yeah. the years. I guess um, I think you can tell that in both of these responses there's probably a bit of a lack of humility coming through in mm. how we do this. Mm. Um, yeah, and that lack of humility isn't probably very helpful as we're trying to understand God's word. So God's given us brains to think. Um, but sometimes we can actually use them to kind of get on our high horse and kind of tell God that we think he's wrong in how he set up the world. Um, so that's, I guess, when we're doing that, we, it's actually, um, yeah, something we shouldn't be doing. It's like we're lacking humility. We're not coming and sitting under God's word. We actually need to think of how to read God's word humbly. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Yeah, no. So you're suggesting that to deal with this concurrency thing, that humility is needed because, uh, yeah, after all, when you stop and think about it, God is God uh, and we're human, which means God's infinite, but we 
are not. We're finite. So it makes sense that as finite beings, uh, we won't be able to get our heads around everything that we find uh, in God's word. Uh, if we come across something in the Bible that makes us go, that can't be right, or here's a contradiction that's wrong, well, we need to just kind of step back for a second and, and consider the possibility that just because I don't understand it doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. <laughs> there's, there's a humility required to do that, but just because I don't understand it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be wrong, right? Which is important because otherwise uh, we'll actually end up chucking out the bits of the Bible that we don't understand quickly. Uh, but we don't have to do that, do we? Uh, instead of that, we can go, okay, I don't fully understand how both of these things can be true, but clearly they do both coexist. They're both taught in the Bible. They're both necessary because the Bible teaches both of them. Uh, I might not know how that works, but that's okay. I don't need to fully understand both of them for them to actually concur in the Bible, but uh, just because I don't fully understand it doesn't mean it can't be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know how that sounds to you, Catherine. Does that ring true with you? Yeah, that it does. I also do start to feel a little bit scared that it means we've got to throw out our brains as a Christian. Like, if are we, mm. yeah, what does that actually mean in that area? So does that mean we have to take on something that people often call blind faith? Like, I just have to accept it and deal with it. So, yeah, so it makes me think, what do we actually do when we come across something that we can't quite wrap our minds around? Yeah, so it's a good question. When you come across something that's hard to wrap your mind around, the key thing that's needed uh, is humility. Uh, just that knowledge that God is infinite. I'm not, I'm finite. And just because I don't understand it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. Uh, but then there's this other thing going on in the Bible again and again, and again right through the Bible where God invites people time and time again through the Bible to ask him for wisdom, to seek wisdom, uh, to try and grow in the knowledge of our heart and the knowledge of our minds. And so we should do that. When we come across stuff that's hard to understand, we should ask God to help us to understand, to do what we can to grow in our understanding. But do it also knowing that, you know, particularly with, with uh, the harder stuff like predestination and free will and how that all works, that uh, we can try and understand it and we should, and that's good. And we should ask God for help, but that doesn't mean in two minutes from now uh, that I'll have my head around it. It might be in two decades from now that I start to feel a little bit clearer <laughs> or three decades or, or maybe five years. It might be that, you actually read the Bible slowly, carefully over weeks, months, and years, and you spend the rest of your life having your mind stretched by the Bible, by God's word, by the encouragement of Christians around you. And that's the kind of thing you won't find in, a, in a two minutes on a comment thread in Facebook or reading a quick blog on something or a Google search. That, that kind of thing is a very different, different ballpark. Yeah. So that's the idea of concurrency. Yeah, so it's a kick up the pants to actually keep thinking hard about and to what be the humble. Is, but also to be humble. Yeah. And to stick it for the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. To cool. stick with it. Cool. Mm. Well, there's our theology hotspot for this week. Um, if you've got any more ideas about what we can kind of discuss in these little segments, please chuck them in the comments. We'd love to keep um, just doing something random or something that's coming up in the passage. Um, so, yeah, please keep throwing ideas our way hmm. um and next i think we've got tanya to do a bible reading so tanya hello uh hi everybody um yeah i really like that theology hotspot is it really rings true for me like just being able to trust god with the things you don't understand and understanding that we do have jesus with us too and and god gives us wisdom to understand the things that we need um, so that's great. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to pray for us first before we read. Um, so please bow your heads and pray with me. So, uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we can come together to read your word and to listen and learn about uh, the sacrifice that you made to win us back to you. 
I, I thank you that you love us so much and that's just an overwhelming love and we we the only thing we can do in response to that is to kneel and to rejoice in that i thank you so much for that i pray you open our hearts open our eyes so that we can see your grace and so we can see uh, the wisdom of your word and most of all to see how much you love us uh, through what you've done for us i pray all these things in your son's name amen all right um so we're going to be reading from philippians chapter 2 verses 12 to 18 and we're going to be reading from the csb version um okay so i'll start Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in, in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Um, uh, <laughs> then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. I'll pass over to Peter for the talk I now. Hello, can everybody hear me now? Hello, excellent. Sorry about that. That was a, uh, a bum steer for me. Uh, I uh, would like to invite Keith Birchley, uh, who is our special guest tonight. Uh, I'm going to interview Keith. Keith, you there? Can we see and hear you? Yeah, well, I'm here, Pete. Can everybody hear excellent. me? Yeah, ah, we can see Marion there with you too. Hi, Marion. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Now, can you guys, uh, uh, Keith, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, what did you study? Where have you lived and worked? What are you up to these days? Where are you coming to us from tonight? That kind of stuff. Well, we're coming to you from uh, Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby, the capital. Yeah. And um, thanks very much for inviting us, Peter. It's a great privilege and fun for us to join you. As Peter knows, we've got a real vested interest in the AFES work and particularly to arts humanities students like um, art students and musicians. I originally enrolled as a music student at UQ a um, hundred years ago and I was uh, not a Christian and I was there doing a four year music degree and I was converted to Christ in my last year there and went off to Bible college Anyway, since then, I've been basically an AFS staff worker for many, many years, doing Peter's type job, first at the University of Queensland and now up here at uh, the University of uh, Papua New Guinea. So that's our basic story, mate. Mm. Uh, and can I ask you then, uh, speaking about studying music, uh, how did you find studying music full time uh, and then going on to pursue actually being a musician? while uh, once you'd actually become a Christian, what was it like for you as a Christian to do that? Well, the, the thing about my experience was I had a relatively brief time of being both a Christian and pursuing a full-time music career. So I was converted when I was 20, but I was at Bible college two and a half years later. So I had a reasonably short period where I was still working as a musician still training it was classical piano for me i went overseas to do a postgraduate degree in england and i'd only been i'd only been saved 12 months and i was so thrown around that i came home to rethink the decision and drove taxis did a few things 
anyway, after a period of another 12 months, I just decided, no, I was so unsettled that I went off to Bible college instead. And it's been all one direction since then. So I don't have a lot of years of experience of being a professional musician and trying to keep a solid Christian life going as well. In the field in which I was in, that was always going to be really challenging. And I really feel for the students there that you're dealing with because some careers you have to be married to. And I think the arts and creative things tend to be like that. And we can only really be married to Jesus Christ. And so it's always going to be a special tension if you're doing something that involves your heart, you work way more than eight hours a day. So there's always special tensions for the creative artist type person with maintaining an even stable Christian walk. Perhaps I can talk a bit about that later or you will, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be good to come back to you on that one. But um, for now, can you just tell us, so you're currently, uh, you've uh, at a time of life when it would have been easy just to start winding things up and taking things a bit easier. You guys have moved to Papua New Guinea uh, to share Jesus with uh, people who live there. Uh, um, what on earth made you decide to do that? And uh, can you tell us a bit about what life is like for you and ministry is like for you in PNG? Well, um, as you know, Peter, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty challenging a lot of the time up here. Some of our fr thought, friends thought we were crazy because when we came up here, Port Moresby had a bad rap as the second least livable city in the world. It's got yeah. to be better in the last five years. But um, sure, there are, there are significant objective difficulties and security is one of them. But the people are lovely. Uh, the Christian people are lovely and welcoming. But sure, there are challenges about living here, but that's more than compensated for by the warm heartedness and Christian open mindedness to learn and grow. Uh, your question about why we actually came, that's a really good one. I think it was a convergence of a number of factors, Peter, but one of them was just for me, slowly developing more a perception as a world Christian. I started going to the CMS summer school we're called the missionary conference and at that stage in AFI we had 135 senior staff like you Catherine um, Bible college trained staff 135 around the whole country and the PNG movement contacted us they had one staff worker for the entire country of eight million people and he'd only done I think eight or nine months in a Bible college and we just thought this is really unfair. And so we put up our hands. So I think probably just the scale of the needs overseas, just I think the Lord really laid that on our hearts in a big way. We'd spent many years, 22 years with AFES, and uh, there, were, there were far more staff at the University of Queensland than in this whole country. And so we thought, gee, that's a bit ordinary. So... Um, there were great younger generation of staff like you and Catherine and the others there in Brisbane. And we thought, blow this for a joke, we should probably, in our dotage, try and help up here. So that's probably the main reason, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from you guys in a little while. Uh, we're going to spend a bit of time uh, in God's word in Philippians. So look forward thank to you it. for sharing that. And we'll, uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you again uh, in a little while. But I think for now, we're going to jump straight into our Bible talk. Uh, and I want to kick things off tonight uh, by asking you, uh, will you still be a Christian in 50 years? Will you still be a Christian in 50 years uh, from tonight? Uh, that's a question for the Christians, obviously, though I hope if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian that you'll find the, uh, the answer to that from the Christians who are tuning in will be something that's interesting to you. So Christians, will you still be a Christian in 50 years? Will you still be trusting in Jesus when you grow old? And if you think you will be trusting in Jesus, what makes you think you'll stay a Christian? What makes you think you can 
trust in Jesus for year after year, decade after decade, without walking away. Uh, I first rocked up to university uh, in Lismore in 2001. And in, in some ways, I've basically been hanging around universities ever since, so 20 years now. And I can tell you during that time, I've seen far too many people rock up to university as Christians or maybe becoming Christians at university, but then they leave uni no longer a Christian. And that's including students at South Bank at the Con and the College of Arts. Or they, they seem strong in their faith when they're at uni, but when they head out into the real world, uh, within a decade or so, uh, they're no longer a Christian. In fact, when I first started full-time ministry uh, in South Bank and I started hanging out more at the Con and the College of Art, I tried to contact the student uh, who used to run this Christian group in the past. Uh, he was a Christian guy majoring in opera singing at the Con, but I found out that he wasn't a Christian anymore. Now, he used to run this group, and that's really sad. Uh, but it's, it's not just that Christians walk away from Jesus. It's that Christian leaders can walk away from Jesus as well. Uh, Catherine and I have seen ministers of churches that we know walk away from Jesus. Uh, the women's worker at Catherine's church, when she was at uni and when she was in her early 20s, she's no longer following Jesus. Uh, there are authors of Christian books that I've loved and benefited from who have walked away. Uh, there are people whose Bible talks I used to download and listen to for encouragement that have gone down in flames. Uh, it can happen to anyone, anyone, and it does. And so I want to ask you tonight, what about you? If you're a Christian, that is, if you're a Christian now, what makes you think you'll stay a Christian? Uh, in 10 years, 20 years, more, will you still be trusting in Jesus? Friends, becoming a Christian is a big deal, but staying a Christian is a way bigger deal than many of us realise. Uh, too many people take for granted that they'll keep following Jesus, but then slowly over years, they walk away. And so, let me ask you, what does it look like to stay a Christian? What does it look like to stay a Christian? And what can you do to stay a Christian? Or if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, if you're tuning in, it's great to have you here with us. But if you were to become a Christian, what would it look like to stay a Christian and for it not just to be a fad for a couple of years before you move on? What would that look like? Thanks again for being here tonight. Uh, whether you're watching with us on Zoom or tuning into Facebook Live, uh, just a few reminders. I will stop for Q&A at a couple of different points throughout the talk. Uh, so if you've got any comments or questions you'd like dealt with, uh, drop them into the Zoom chat or the, the Facebook Live comments as we go. Uh, after the Bible talk, if you're not on Zoom, uh, you can jump onto Zoom and, and join us. You can find the details on our Facebook page and we'll be hanging out together for a while afterwards. Uh, and also make sure you've got your one of these. Make sure you've got a Bible handy because I'd love you to keep your eyes on that. We use the CSB uh, here at Griffith Christian Students. Uh, I've got two points tonight. Uh, number one, gripping onto Jesus and number two gripping onto Jesus together so gripping onto Jesus and gripping onto Jesus together so come with me to our, our first point uh, gripping on to Jesus uh, the first thing I want you to notice about tonight's passage the passage that Tanya read for us tonight is that it starts with the word therefore and so of course you're a good English student I hope when you see the therefore, you've got to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Uh, the Apostle Paul, he, he's writing this letter to Christians who are living in Philippi, and we're dropping in partway through his letter. 
Now, Philippi, we've talked about this in previous weeks. Uh, Philippi is a city with a very strongly Roman flavour. Uh, some would refer to it as Rome away from Rome. That's a good way of thinking about the city of Philippi. But Paul's writing to the Christians as people who trust in Jesus and telling them that they should be living their lives as citizens, not of Rome, but of heaven. Living not as citizens of, G of Caesar's kingdom, but they should be living as citizens of Jesus' kingdom. Uh, the reason they're citizens of Jesus' kingdom is because Jesus has come into the world and died for them. Uh, we read that amazing passage of you with us last week where you can read in, in chapter 2, verse 8, about how Jesus, he humbled himself to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So the people Paul's writing to, they're, they're citizens of King Jesus, the king who died for them, uh, to make them his citizens. And so in verse 12, in tonight's passage, Paul says, therefore, because of all that, because Jesus died for you, because Jesus saved you, because you've been made citizens of his kingdom, therefore, we'll pick it up with me in verse 12, Verse 12 of chapter 2, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your, your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What does that mean? How do you work out your own salvation? Does that mean work to get yourself saved? Because now God's done his bit and now it's all up to you. No. Does it mean, yeah, you're saved, but now perseverance in salvation depends entirely on you? No. It can't mean those things. And here's why. It can't mean that you have to work hard to save yourself. Why? Well, because Paul's already written in this letter about how the grace and peace come to us freely from God. In, in chapter three, in a future week, uh, we'll be looking at this, but Paul very explicitly and carefully spells out how this works. We don't save ourselves through working hard. We're saved by Jesus when we put our faith in him. Trusting in Jesus' work is how you're saved, relying on what he's already done for you at the cross. So work out your own salvation can't mean work hard to save yourself because Jesus saves, not us. And so what does work out your salvation mean? Well. In a sense, Paul's saying in another way what he's been saying all along through this letter. To work out your own salvation means to live as citizens of Jesus. To work hard to grip on to Jesus' saving work. Uh, what hard work do you need to do? How do you grip on to Jesus? Well, like we've been seeing in Philippians, it means responding to Jesus' sacrificial love by having that same attitude of Jesus and sacrificially loving each other. Uh, it means rejoicing in the advancement of the gospel, even amidst sufferings and setbacks. All those things are hard work, right? But here's the key. When we work hard to live for Jesus... God's doing the work in us. It's God who's doing the work in us. Grab your Bible again. Uh, verse 13, you can see it. Verse 13, so he says, as we've already seen, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So here's how it works. You work hard for it's God 
working in you. We work hard precisely because it's God who's working in us. God himself is working in us both to will and to act. God works in us at the level of our wills and he works in us at the level of our doing. So we work hard, but it's God who's working in us, helping us to grip onto Jesus. So from our side, it looks like we're working hard. It feels like we're working hard. But from God's side, he's working in us. He's moving our wills. He is influencing our work. And in case you haven't figured this out yet, this is a good example of our theology hotspot of concurrence when two seemingly opposite things happen at the same time. Not contradictory, but in harmony. We work, but as we work, God is working inside of us. This passage helps us to see how that works. Uh, we're not lemmings. We're not robots being controlled with a remote control. We decide, we will, we work. But as we do those things, God's at work at a deeper level inside of us, which means we should be working hard. We should be working hard. If you want to stay a Christian, there's some work ahead. Uh, I had a friend during my years at uni uh, who developed a bit of a drinking problem. Uh, it got to the point where um, uh, uh, weeknights he would uh, be sinking a six pack of beer at a minimum just every night. Uh, and then when it got to the weekends, it'd be more like two, three, four, six packs of beer and he'd space them out to make it more okay with, with ginger beers. So he'd be putting in this massive amount of drinking uh, just every night, really, but especially on the weekends. And uh, I was in a Bible study group with him, and uh, a couple of us challenged him together one night and said, uh, Hey, mate, I think you need to uh, think about your drinking habits. You're obviously drinking a bit too much, uh, <laughs> let alone even follow what it's got to do with following Jesus. It's actually just really unhealthy and it's negatively impacting your life. So you should think about giving it a miss. And uh, his response, was, no, nah. if God wanted me to change, he'd change me. And so the fact that he didn't feel like he needed to do anything about it was a sign to him that, uh, well, God didn't think it was important for him to change because if God thought it was important for me to change, then he'd change me. So, no, nah, I'm not going to change because if God wanted me to change, he'd change me. Friends, that's not how it works. From our side, it looks like us making the effort. But when we make the effort, God's doing the work inside of us. Uh, in other words, these verses are not an incentive to passive laziness. They're not an invitation to take things easy and let God do it all. They're the opposite. I hope you can see that. The way Paul puts it, puts it is... When you know that your hard work is actually God's work, God's work happening inside of you, that's actually an incentive to work hard. Knowing that God's working inside of you should make you even more strongly resolved to will and to act in ways that please him. In other words, staying a Christian is hard work. Literally hard work. Gripping on to Jesus is hard work. Sticking with Jesus means continually working out your salvation and working hard at loving people, working hard at obeying Jesus in every single area of your life, working hard to live for Jesus even when you're suffering, even when it means being humiliated. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling means if you're not working hard to live for Jesus, then you probably won't stay a Christian. If you're not gripping onto Jesus, you're letting go. It's scary, isn't it? 
So are you working hard? Are you gripping on to Jesus? Now I'm going to hit the pause button there and we're going to stop for our first Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to jump uh, onto the Facebook comments and see what we can see there. All right. All right, so no questions so far on Facebook. That's all right. I'll check out the, uh, the Zoom chat. Yeah, cool. Will Langridge says, I like Bonhoeffer's way of thinking about it. Faith is only real when there is obedience never without it and faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience thanks will for commenting that if you've got any uh, other comments or questions along the way please don't hesitate to drop them or join us afterwards on zoom you might get lucky and get to ask keith he'll give you a better answer than me probably all right well i'm going to move on for now there's no more questions at this moment uh so far uh we've seen that Staying a Christian means hard work, gripping onto Jesus, knowing that it's God who's at work inside of us. Now, that sounds tiring, doesn't it? It sounds like it'll be hard work to stick with it. And it is hard work, which is why, like I told you at the start, a lot of people who rock up to uni don't stay a Christian. They, uh, they walk away from Jesus. So if you're... Uh, watching tonight how can you make sure that you keep gripping onto jesus what does it look like to stay a christian well one of the huge keys to gripping onto jesus is not doing it alone we need to grip onto jesus together and we're on to our second point tonight gripping onto jesus now when you read the bible in english uh, it's really easy to miss this, so make sure you don't miss it. But everything Paul writes in this letter to the Philippians is addressed to yous. Not you. It's you guys together. So not you sitting in your bedroom on Zoom or Facebook, uh, but yous. Now, I know, sorry about the cringe factor there. Use sounds terrible in English. Uh, but the problem is that in English, you, individual, and you, plural, y'all, if you're an American, they look and sound exactly the same. That They look the same. They're spelt the same. And so what that means for us is it's dead easy to miss that it's not about you. It's about use. Uh, that's made worse by the fact that so much of the time when we sit down and read our Bibles, we're doing it on our own. And so we're reading it thinking just about me rather than hearing God's word together. Uh, making the effort to read the Bible with others is always hard and remembering it's written to us rather than to me is always hard. But go figure, COVID-19 has made it even harder than usual. But hard as it is to remember, we need to get in our heads that these words aren't written to me or to you. They're written to us together. They're written to you guys together. And so what this means is to stay a Christian, you need to do these things. You need to grip onto Jesus with others together. And so read it with me. With that understanding in mind, the plural you, read it with me. Verse 14 of chapter 2. Verse 14, you guys together, verse 14, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you guys may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you guys shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Now, this is like family language, isn't it? Hey, you guys, as you do life together, as you hang out with each other, can you stop the grumbling and the arguing? 
Stop irritating each other and being selfish. Try treating each other nicely, lovingly and selflessly like pure children. I could do with a couple of pure children. My children don't sound like that. My kids don't act like that. But then again, <clears throat> neither do I a lot of the time. Because I can be selfish. I can be proud. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I can do my fair share of grumbling uh, and of talking back. But Paul says, knock it off. Work hard at kindly relating to one another. Excuse me. Because then if you're doing that, you'll stand out. You, you'll look different to the people around you. If you work hard at treating other people well, says Paul, then you'll shine like stars in the world by holding on to the word of life. What does it look like to stay a Christian? Well, it means working hard at how we love each other, not imitating the same relational patterns of the world, but holding on together to the word of life, not holding on alone, but holding on together to the word of life, gripping on to Jesus together. Now, I prefer to talk about this as gripping on because holding on, it, it just sounds a bit passive. I, I'm just hanging here, hanging on, hanging out, waiting, no big deal. But gripping on, that sounds active. That sounds hard. That sounds like work. And that sounds like what Paul's talking about, doesn't it? Gripping on together to Jesus. And we so often think of the Christian life as a solo thing and so. I read the Bible, I pray, I go to church, I serve, I do evangelism, I, I, I. But that's not what it means to be a Christian. That's not the way it's meant to be when you follow Jesus. Our society might be incredibly individualistic, but the Bible just isn't. Christian community is not individualistic like that. It's not what it's like when you know Jesus. It shouldn't be. This passage doesn't say shine like a single star. It says shine like stars together. The picture here is of the Milky Way. Many stars shining bright together. And that is a much brighter, more beautiful picture, isn't it? How long will we need to keep gripping on together? Well, verse 16 you see in verse 16 that this isn't a temporary thing, but Paul urges the Philippians and us to keep gripping on, to keep shining until the day of Christ. Until we die or until Jesus returns, we're to grip on to Jesus together. Now, once again, COVID has, ma has massively reinforced our tendency to be a single solo star and to try and make it on our own. But we just have to push against that. We have, even now, even amidst the need for social distancing, we've got to push against that. Now, that doesn't mean that social distancing isn't important. It really is. But it does mean we need to be together in safe ways. We need each other to grip on to Jesus. Like someone who trains as a symphony instrumentalist or a jazz bass player, you're not designed to do this alone forever. We're saved to live life together. We need each other. A jazz bass player who's forever on their own in their bedroom, it's just not the way it's meant to be, is it? We're meant to be in it together. And so we should take steps, Queensland Health approved, to reconnect and recommune and to regather in ways that are safe so that we can work hard together, gripping on to Jesus together. But remember, as we do that, it's God doing the hard work in us. 
from our side, we're working hard, but from God's side, he is enabling our work together. And when we do that, well, to the world, it looks like we shine like stars. One big communal advertisement for Jesus. It should be noticeable. Uh, when I was at uni, uh, I arrived at uni kind of a, a very weak Christian. And I wanted to get better at reading the Bible, but I'd never really known how to do it. And uh, I moved into a, a share house with a couple of guys at the church that I landed at. And I had this desire to read the Bible that I'd had for a long time, but I just didn't know how to do it. But when I moved in with those guys, those guys were actually really encouraging. And they would sit at the breakfast table with their Bible open. They'd sit on the couch and read the Bible with their girlfriends. They'd actually go, hey, how about we try spending some time together as a house once a week, reading the Bible together. And they would just have that as a part of their daily life. Some of those guys, you'd see them reading the Bible on their own. They'd be reading it with their girlfriends. They'd be reading it with the house. They'd be reading it with other people. And just they think, man, are you, are you reading the Bible all the time? And a lot of the time, they really were just reading the Bible a lot of the time. And through actually living with those guys, I learned with them, from them, how to get better at reading the Bible. See, it took me to be together with other Christians to finally imbibe that skill, that ability that I'd struggled to imbibe on my own. Doing it with others helps me to get there. Now I'm going to pause for another Q&A. So bear with me while I check that. <clears throat> Jumping onto Facebook. Does this mean a Christian can lose their salvation? You had to ask that, didn't you, Matt? Here's what we can say. My short answer, read the book of Hebrews. <laughs> Seriously, read the book of Hebrews. But uh, if you want a little bit more information than that, uh, the way it's often been described to me, and I found this helpful, is that Christians, genuine believers are the people who will spend their life trusting in Jesus but heeding all the warning signs about the dangers of walking away from Jesus. So if you are a, a, a genuine believer, then you will trust in Jesus you'll take really seriously the possibility that you could walk away from Jesus. And because you take it seriously and you work hard and you grip onto Jesus together with other Christians, then you won't walk away. Now, Jesus tells a, a parable of seed uh, sown in different kinds of soil uh, in a couple of the Gospels. I'd encourage you to go and read that. Uh, as well and that talks about uh, different responses to hearing the gospel of Jesus to hearing about uh, the news of Jesus kingdom uh, some hear it and it just bounces straight off them some hear it and it's just so shallow it gets it, it dies really soon uh, the best kind of soil is the one where the the, the seed plants into the soil and it grows it flourishes it, it's fruitful it bears 30 60 100 fold it's really wonderful but there's one in there that's really scary. And this is the kind of thing a genuine believer would hear and go, okay, this, this means I should work really hard to make sure this is not me. But there's a kind of seed that's planted into a soil that grows really well. And uh, it's, it's a healthy plant in many ways, except it's planted amidst the thorns and the weeds and the thistles and as it grows, the thorns and the thistles grow up alongside it. But slowly over time, those thorns, thistles, weeds choke the healthy plant and it dies. I take it that means it's possible to look like you've got the, res the right response to Jesus, to actually appear like you're even growing for a time, but to still end up being choked. 
Now, how do you make sure that's not you? You listen to these warnings. You grip on to Jesus together. You heed the warnings. You, you read Hebrews and you listen to all of the dangers of the need to, to never stop coming to Jesus on your own and with others. Uh, so I hope that's helpful, Matt. We can come back to that more later if you like. Checking out the Zoom chat now. Go a bit crazy. Thanks, Josie. I think that's questions for tonight. I'm almost done, guys. And then I'm going to be inviting Keith back on because he's got far more wisdom on uh, than me to share on how to stay a Christian. But before I uh, invite Keith back, can I just invite you uh, tonight? If you're tuning in and you're not a Christian, then this passage that we're reading tonight, it's like an advertisement for what you'll be in on when you trust in Jesus. When you trust in Jesus, you get to be a part of the community. You get to be a part of a family. Uh, they say at our stage of history, we've never been more connected digitally, but at the same time, we've never been more disconnected from each other relationally. Now, that was true before COVID, so now, of course, it's worse. We're far more isolated and disconnected physically and relationally, and it sucks. But life in Jesus' kingdom is different. Uh, he saves us to a new and a more wonderful reality, a community, a family, a kingdom. Now, if you don't trust in Jesus yet, can you see how much better life with Jesus could be for you? And so I want to urge you, hear the warnings tonight, put your trust in Jesus, in what he has done for you at the cross, and join the family. Join the community. Become a citizen of Jesus' kingdom. Find yourself side by side with others who will love you, who will help you, who will walk with you, who will do life with you, and for whom you can do the same. Uh, it's, it's better by far than doing life on your own. So seriously, if you don't yet trust in Jesus, give it a try. If you are a Christian, if you do trust in Jesus, are you gripping on to Jesus? Or are you being lazy in your relationship with God? Uh, the scarier way to ask this same question is, are you gripping on to Jesus or are you falling away from Jesus? Are you walking away? Uh, think about it. What are you working on in your life? Uh, if you don't have stuff that you're proactively working on in your life, that means you're in danger of losing your grip and walking away. And so it's time to step up the effort to put some work in. But whatever you do, don't work out how to live for Jesus on your own. If you're struggling with sin, don't struggle on your own. If you're relying, oh, sorry, if you're trying to get better at reading the Bible, don't do it on your own. If you're hopeless at prayer and you want to get better at it, don't do it on your own. If you need to become more servant-hearted, then don't do it on your own. If you're battling porn or some other kind of addiction, if you're addicted to procrastinating online and you need to stop, if any of those things are you, don't do that struggle on your own. Talk to someone else about it. None of this stuff works when you try it on your own. It's not the way it's meant to be. We need to grip onto Jesus together. And that's going to mean working out our salvation together, helping each other to grip onto Jesus. And if we're doing that, that means our lives should be looking different and we should be shining like stars in our world. Now, do be careful here because it's possible you understand this. It's possible you think you're already doing this when in reality you're living like a loner. You, you don't get close enough to others to actually put this into practice. Uh, Catherine was sharing with me uh, earlier uh, that
that she can remember being taught by the women's worker at her church on this very passage, being encouraged to keep following Jesus just like I'm teaching you now and uh, being encouraged to stand for him like stars in the sky. But that woman who taught her that is no longer a Christian. It's really sad. What about you? Don't just understand this. You've got to actually do something to grip onto Jesus together. And that'll mean getting close to others, working hard together, knowing that God is at work in you. People should be able to look at the way Christians relate to each other, whether it be at uni or, or a gig or, or at work, wherever you are, and tell that you are different because of the way that Christians communally grip onto Jesus. Now, is that how people would describe Griffith Christian students at the Con or at the College of Arts? And if not, then what do we need to do? Now, look, you've heard enough from me tonight. Uh, we've got someone with us tonight who's far more experienced than me at putting this into practice. So I'm going to invite Keith back. Good to see you, Keith. And, Thanks, uh, Peter. We, we've just heard that becoming a Christian is a huge deal, but staying a Christian is a way bigger deal than we expect. Uh, you guys are heading into the latter years of your life, and it looks very much like you've both managed to stay a Christian and continually make sacrificial decisions to keep gripping onto Jesus. How on earth have you managed that? Well, uh Thanks for having us along tonight, Peter. And uh, by the way, it was great to hear you, mate. And thank you for an excellent message. Um, just thought I'd put that little plug in. Um, My pleasure. How have we done it? Well, in principle, it's there in your talk tonight. Uh, stay connected. And uh, the other thing I'd just add is just some um, exercise in the gripping muscles. Exercise in the gripping muscles. And that is usually best done in risk taking situations so we tend to grip on and we tend to those muscles need exercising so i just encourage all you guys there griffith christian students um take little steps in risk taking because that's how you exercise those muscles and stay connected as peter's just been saying if i can just come back to why we came up here to papua new guinea that wasn't a solo decision I remember sitting there with our colleagues in AFES. There were these old fogies about my age who were called the regional directors. And we heard about this big, big need in Papua New Guinea for a senior staff worker to come up here and put in five or 10 years. And we looked around the room and we're talking about it together. And so it wasn't just Keith and Marion deciding we're gonna do this, take this risk for Jesus. Um, we, we talked around the circle and we were the only ones of our colleagues who didn't have aging parents that needed care and needed to be mm. put into retirement, um, you know, particular care. And so both of us had lost our parents, which in one sense was a blessing in that our kids were leaving home. And so we were just about to be empty nesters. We still had our health. So in a sense, it was a group decision that, well, it's Keith and Marion who can probably answer this need better than others. So I just want to affirm what Peter said about staying connected and not being a solo player. Mm. And the other thing is about, about exercising the gripping muscles. We tend to do that best in risk-taking situations. So for us, yeah, it was a real risk. I've got a help, I've got a heart condition. I had a heart attack a long time ago. And so we had all the warnings about medical issues about coming up here. I've mentioned security issues. But to be honest, it's um we've never been more excited about the Christian life. And the five years in Papua New Guinea, I can honestly say been the happiest of my Christian life. Wow. So, yeah, so taking, we exercise those gripping muscles most 
when we're doing things that are outside the comfort zone. So do that in little ways, and that gradually leads to doing it in bigger ways. And for students there, Peter, it might be a matter of, you know, rather than thinking, I'll, I'll go to the Christian group you guys run because I go into campus on Thursday, Friday. How about going into campus on a day when you don't have any lectures just to do Bible study or witnessing or prayer or whatever? Why not take a risk in a small way? And that's how those gripping muscles get good exercise. Mm. That'd be my thought there, mate. Do you want to come mm. back on? Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. Uh, Marion, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I really like the idea of the togetherness because <clears throat> it's hard. It's really hard sharing with someone your faults or the things that are hard in life. But um, that's how we grow and that's how we grow. That's how God changes us. And yeah, so, and the other thing is I'd find it really hard to be here in PNG on my own, but um, together we mm. can, we read the Bible together and we pray together and we share together and, yeah, that's a great, um, a great comfort and a great encouragement and helps us to keep on walking with the Lord. Mm. Mm. That's really helpful. Thanks, guys. Look, uh, before we wrap up and pray, uh, are there any final things you'd like to leave us with? Any final parting words? Oh, oh just, the, uh, just a rave review, mate, that the Christian life, as you mentioned earlier, the Christian life is by far the best life on offer. So though it's walking in the shadow of the cross and on the way to glory, it is just in terms of the social benefits in this world now, nothing compares with it, quite apart from eternity. So do yourself a favour. <laughs> Try out Jesus. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's enough from us. Absolutely. Keith, could I invite you to pray for us? Is that all right? Absolutely. Yeah, love to. Our dear Father in heaven, thanks for the message we've heard tonight from Philippians. And uh, we thank you for the truths that are found in the Bible. Uh, please help us, Heavenly Father, to cling on to Jesus Christ by faith and to take those little risks and help us to stay connected and to cling on to Jesus together and not get lost in our cone of silence and Watch over any who are listening to this Griffith students meeting and who might be in a bit of a cone of silence and help them, Heavenly Father, to have the courage, take the risk and to speak to somebody and find there's really is some fresh air and some oxygen outside our own personal world. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for the great message we've heard and continue to be kind to us and merciful to us and help us to work hard at gripping and we thank you, Lord, that you're at work uh, behind the scenes in all our lives. For Jesus' sake, we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen. Good to see you, mate. We'll sign off. Cool. Thanks so much, Keith. It's been, and Mary, it's been great to have you with us tonight. Um, yeah, I'd just like to encourage everyone to stick around afterwards. We're going to continue, we're going to finish the live stream soon, but we'll have more hangout in the Zoom meeting just for a bit of Q&A and hopefully if Keith and Marion are still around, you can hit them up with some hard questions, um, hopefully about predestination or something like that. Um, so, yeah, just a reminder to keep tuning in to hear more about Philippians and how we can not just shine like a single star on our own but how to shine as the whole Milky Way bearing testimony to Jesus. Please keep considering um, how you can be is exercising your muscles as Keith has encouraged us to do what sort of where's your comfort zone where's your risk taking areas and just think about how you can actually be growing in um just yeah growing in Jesus and persevering with him for the long haul so thanks so much for tuning in tonight we pray that you'll keep thinking through all these things but stick around and have a bit of a chat with us afterwards otherwise we might see you next week bye